Uh, good evening, Hitesh. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, the introduction and also having me uh, present again in your esteemed uh, orthopedicprinciples.com. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, unique topic, transverse sacral fractures. And uh, I think this is an important topic uh, uh, from uh, multiple perspectives. Uh, one is that for uh, orthopedic residents who are learning about uh, pelvic injuries. So this uh, transverse sacral fractures falls in a gray zone, sort of a gray zone where they are not sure whether it should be uh, classified and treated according to a pelvic injury or it is something to be treated as a spine fracture. And uh, there is a certain unique things uh, which everyone should know about these transverse sacral fractures uh, with, in terms of uh, examining the patient, in terms of uh, evaluating the patient and, uh, and planning the treatment. So I'll start with the case presentation. So. Uh, this patient is actually a 22-year-old female uh, who came to the hospital after she fell from a height of about 30 feet onto her legs. Uh, it was an attempted uh, suicide. And uh, when she presented to the emergency department, uh, uh, she presented with severe hypovolemic shock with uh, hemodynamic instability. And uh, once we started resuscitating her, she complained of severe pain in the low back region with uh, shooting pain down, uh, down both the lower limbs. And uh, clinical examination, her rest of the organ systems were fine. Uh, but uh, in neurologically, in the lower limb, she had a normal motor power, but uh, there was a sensory deficit around the perineal region, around the S234 uh, sensory, sensory zones. And uh, she had a urinary retention, and hence we need to catheterize her, and her anal sphincter was also weak. So these are the x-rays which we took uh, at the time of uh, uh, emergency assessment. And as we can see, uh, uh, at, a, at a cursory view, we may not be able to appreciate any major uh, injuries around the pelvic region. But if you see uh, the arcuate line, so these are the arcuate lines uh, which we can see in the uh, third picture on the right side. There are multiple uh, red lines have been marked along the uh, lines of the sacral foramina. So these are called as a sacral arcuate line, similar to the pelvic arcuate line. And when these arcuate lines, if there is a disruption in the arcuate lines, then we indicate that uh, uh, there is a probability a fracture of the sacral zone. So as we can see, the uh, arcuate line in this patient shows a disruption at this level and a disruption at this level also. And there is probably a fracture at the level of the sacral ela. And uh, since it is an emergency evaluation, the lateral radiograph of the spine, which has been taken cross table, is not very uh, helpful. So this Fracture is not well visualized, but uh, we are suspecting some fracture in the sacral uh, region. So what should be the next ideal uh, step to go? So should we get any special views of the pelvis like pelvic inlet and the outlet views to further uh, assess the radiographs? Actually not, because a lot of studies have shown that the clinical diagnosis of a sacral fracture is very troublesome. And in many situations, especially in patients who have a coexistent head injury or a severe uh, injuries of the chest and the abdomen, there are chances of missing the diagnosis or delaying the diagnosis by up to 70 percentage. And the plain and the special views like inlet and out views, uh, even though they are the first line of investigation, they could miss the fracture in up to 50 percentage of the situation. Hence, so whenever you we suspect a sacral fracture, there is no point in the delaying further investigation and we should have a low threshold to get a CT scan. And uh, so these are the uh, coronal and uh, sagittal images of the patient. Uh, uh, of the patient. So as we can see, there is a fracture involving the uh, transverse process of the L5 on the right side. There is a comminuter fracture of fracture of the sacrum. So there is a longitudinal component which is going medial to the sacral facet. So this is a very important observation. It's going medial to the sacral facet. And uh, down through the first sacral foramen, there is a horizontal disruption of the fracture. And further, again, there is a longitudinal component, which is again going medial to the uh, sacral phase, facet. So we can see multiple other fracture lines. So one of the fracture lines is actually extending down to the lower part of the sacrum as well. And in the sagittal view, we can see that uh, the uh, bone is actually displaced. So the distal fragment has gone anterior. So this is actually classified in the Roy Camille's classification of transverse fractures as a type 2 transverse fracture. So um, in general, if, if this patient is presented, how would we classify this fracture? Because we are seeing multiple lines. So we are seeing a 
two longitudinal lines going through the sacral foramina and a, a transverse fracture which is going through the S1 sacral zone. So how would we classify the fracture, whether it will be a longitudinal fracture or a high transverse or a low transverse? Generally, if you see sacral fractures can be broadly classified into longitudinal fractures and transverse fractures. This is the broad classification. Longitudinal fracture, fractures are the one which are very common. Those are the fractures which we regularly see in our uh, uh, practice. They are usually associated with the pelvic ring injury. Typically, an injury uh, mechanism involving a lateral compression or a vertical shear of the pelvis. When it disrupts the anterior ring of the pelvis, the posterior ring also when it has to disrupt, it disrupts either through the sacroiliac joint or through a longitudinal fracture of the sacrum. So when these patients present, usually it's easy to diagnose these fractures in the pelvis radiograph itself. And uh, again, uh, these are very unstable injuries with a, uh, with a uh, quite significant hemodynamic instability due to rupture of the pelvic veins. And these uh, sacral fractures are managed according to the principles of managing the pelvic ring injury. Whereas the transverse fractures, these are very uh, uncommon injuries. Uh, so among all transverse fractures, uh, all sacral fractures, only uh, 10 to 15 percentage are all uh, transverse sacral fractures. They are usually isolated fractures. They are not usually coexistent with the pelvic ring injury, typically called as a suicide jumpers fracture. And uh, they usually happen following a fall, direct fall onto the buttock region or on the extended legs. They are subdivided into two types. Uh, the one is the low transverse sacral fracture, where the transverse fracture line passes below the sacroiliac joint. And the second type is a high transverse sacral fracture, where the sacral uh, fracture line passes above or at the level of the sacroiliac joint. So the low transverse fractures, they usually occur following a direct fall onto the buttock region. There is usually no major structural instability to the pelvis or the spine. Sometimes, rarely, it can involve the lower sacral nerves. Usually, we do not uh, uh, see any systemic disturbances in terms of hemodynamic instability in these patients or localized pain over the uh, sacral coccygeal region. So, these patients are very well treated by conservative measures like rest, use of, use of a cushion while sitting and analgesics, and they usually have very good outcomes. So, this is an example of a patient with a low transverse sacral fracture. And uh, the patient also had a fracture at the level of uh, L2 with a neurological deficit, which was treated surgically, while the lower transverse sacral fracture was treated conservatively with good outcomes. Coming to the other major uh, chunk of injury which we need to learn about is the high transverse sacral fracture. These are unique fractures, uh, and uh, even though they are classified as a transverse fracture, they are not uh, true transverse fractures. I will explain about them in detail later and they affect the stability of both the spine as well as the pelvis. So unlike a longitudinal fracture which affects the uh, stability of the pelvis mainly, a high transverse sacral fracture can affect the stability of both the spine as well as the pelvis. And these are usually high velocity injuries and they have a high incidence of neurological deficit also. So they were first uh, described by Roy Kemmel who classified them into three types. Type 1, there is a simple kyphosis. Type 2, there is an anterior displacement of the distal fragment associated with the focal kyphosis at the level of the fracture. Type 3 is a posterior displacement of the distal fragment with low doses at that level. So coming to the unique aspects of these uh, high transverse fractures. So when we consider the low transverse fracture, so this blue line is a low transverse fracture. So whenever there is a fracture through uh, the sacrum below the sacroiliac joint, there is a, a, a zone into which the fracture line can extend and the fracture can get displaced. Whereas if you have a high transverse fracture at the level of the sacroiliac joint, the transverse fracture line cannot e exit out through the pelvis. So it cannot exit out through the ilium bone on either side. So it naturally finds its uh, exit, uh, exit to, through longitudinal fractured lines over the uh, sacral ala. So this is uh, how a typical uh, high transverse fracture is formed. So either at the S1 or the S2 level, there is a transverse component and which leads and which extends and which exits out of the sacrum through the sacral ala. So it's not a true transverse fracture. It is a combination of both transverse as well as longitudinal fractures. But the main instability is determined by the transverse fractures and hence they are being classified as a high transverse sacral fractures.
and uh, they have been classified into three types uh, uh, u-shaped h-shaped or lambda shaped and many of these uh, fractures may not be classified into one of these types sometimes you have a u along with the extension down uh, something like that will be there in, di in different patients but the basic principles of management are similar in most of these patients so the second thing which we need to know about these high transverse sacral fractures is that these fractures are typically spinopelvic disruptions. So as we can see, the purple colored region uh, of the sacrum is the one which is fractured and it is completely dissociated from the pelvis. So that part of the sacral uh, bone is attached to the uh, proximally to the spine, whereas the rest of the sacral bone is attached to the pelvis. So now the spine and the pelvis are completely disrupted from each other. So this uh, mandates it uh, to be treated as an unstable fracture. What about neurological deficit? So these patients have a high incidence of neurological deficit, almost uh, 60 to 90 percentage. The reason being that if you uh, go back to our basic Denis classification of uh, sacral fractures, uh, Denis classified the sacral fractures into three zones. Zone one is the sacral ala, zone two is the sacral foramina, and zone through three is through the uh, central uh, sacral, sacral canal, right? So if you look at the transverse sacral fracture, the high transverse sacral fracture, it is actually involving all three zones of the uh, uh, zones of this uh, Denis uh, sacral flac uh, fracture classification. So it involves the uh, zone one over here, the zone through to the sacral foramina and also the central sacral canal. And further, sometimes these longitudinal extensions, sometimes they go laterally into the sacral ala or sometimes into the sacral foramina as well. So these the tra high transverse fractures are one which can typically involve all three zones of the uh, Dennis classification. Hence the chances and uh, injury to the, uh, to the neural structures is much high and uh, hence these patients have a higher incidence of neurological deficit. So if you look at the most uh, recent classification given by the AU spine, where do we place these transverse sacral fractures? So uh, Evo Spine has classified uh, the sacral uh, fractures into type A, type B, type C, similar to the thoracolumbar fracture classification. Type A are the very simple innocuous injuries. So they are the lower sacral fractures. So our A3, A3 will be the low transverse sacral fracture. Whereas the type C fractures, which are, which are associated with the gross instability of the spine and the pelvis, so C0 will be the undisplaced high transverse fracture. So this is the undisplaced high transverse fracture, whereas the displaced one will be classified as a C3 type of the AO spine classification. So coming to the management, so how are we going to manage this patient? So does this patient require a surgical fixation or can this patient be treated conservatively? And if at all we are planning to do surgery in this patient, is there a role for an emergency surgery considering that she has a neurological deficit? And should we reduce the fracture? How to reduce the fracture? And is there a role for decompressing the nerve roots which have been injured? What does the literature say? So the prognosis in these patients depends mainly on the neurological outcome. So if at all uh, we are worried about the two things in this patient, uh, with the tr high transverse fractures. One is the spinopelvic instability, the bony instability. Second aspect is the neurological injury to the nerve roots. So this the neurological deficit actually can happen due to three factors. One is the involvement of the central cauda equina. The second one is the damage to the nerve roots when they exit out to the sacral foramina. And third thing is the injury to the lumbosacral plexus. So the lumbosacral plexus are formed just in front of the sacral region. And the uh, extensive injury that happens over the sacrum results in formation of a hematoma around the lumbosacral plexus and result in urological deficit. So uh, again, this injury to the nerve roots, the lumbosacral plexus or the central cauda equina can be of three types. It could be a neuropraxia, axonotmesis or neuronotmesis. So the only indication for surgery which is clearly given in literature is the presence of an acute cauda equina syndrome in a patient with a, a sacral fracture. Whereas patients having unilateral deficit, for example, a unilateral involvement of the S1 uh, root alone or the for involvement of the lumbar sacral plexus alone is, has always been a matter of controversy. 
for all other neurological deficits both surgical as well as non surgical treatment options have been available and both have been shown to have similar long term outcomes at the end of uh, years so uh, if at all we are planning to do surgery so but does the type of surgery and how early are we going to do the surgery is it going to matter with the neurological outcomes so this is one of the systematic uh, reviews published in 2017 so they found out uh, uh, the rate of partial or even full neurological recovery after an indirect decompression so indirect decompression uh, involves some partial reduction of the fracture as much as possible without exposing the fracture site versus a formal laminectomy so after fixing the fracture you do a formal laminectomy of the sacrum to release the pressure of the nerve roots so both the procedures are found to have equal functional outcomes at the end of years again how early are we going to do the surgery whether we are going to do the surgery within 72 hours or after 72 hours again it didn't make a big difference in the outcomes so what actually matters is the amount of disruption to the fracture uh, disruption to the neurological structures that happens at the time of injury actually determines the outcome similar to rest of the spinal cord injuries so coming to the principles of treatment so in which type of patients would be advised a non operative conservative line of treatment so patients who do not have a pelvic ring disruption some patients rarely can have a coexistent high transverse fracture with a pelvic uh, ring injury so the pelvic ring rest of the ring is intact again a non operative treatment low transverse fractures and uh, non displaced are only mildly displaced high transverse sacral fractures those are also treated conservatively and fracture line that does not involve the lumbar sacral junction so if we have a uh, longitudinal component to the high transverse fracture which is exiting medial to the sacral facet then it again indicates an instability and in such a situation we may need to uh, fix Actually, if it is going lateral to the uh, facet, it indicates a possible stable injury, which can be treated conservatively. Insufficiency fractures. Typically, insufficiency fractures of the sacrum are typically tra high transverse fractures, and if it is undisplaced, then it can be treated conservatively. And uh, undisplaced fracture without neurological injury again can be treated conservatively. And if at all we are planning operative treatment. Uh, Uh, what are the goals of treatment the main goals of treatment is to restore the uh, spine and pelvic stability so the, the spino pelvic disruption has to be corrected and the rest of the three goals are actually secondary uh, goals so the fixing the unstable fracture stabilization happens indirectly when we fix the spine to the pelvis automatically when we are able to reduce the fracture either partially or completely will be able to relieve the nerve root compression there is actually no need for a formal uh, laminectomy and finally if you fix the fracture we enable the patient to mobilize early thereby avoiding problems of recumbency so uh, the key principle of surgical fixation is we have to understand these injuries as spino pelvic disruptions the center of the sacrum with the spine is completely disrupted from the lateral part of the sacrum which is still attached to the pelvis in uh, principle of fixation is to have a spino pelvic fixation so we put iliac screws either one or two uh, typically bilaterally and this is connected with the screws pedicle screws placed in the l4 and l5 vertebra depending upon the extent of fracture and uh, very rarely if the sacral uh, uh, li is intact we can try to put a sacral screw but uh, most of the situation almost 99% of situations we find that the sacral uh, uh, fracture line is extremely close to the pedicle entry at the level of the sacrum so we may not be able to put an s1 screw so typical construct will extend from l4 l5 to uh, iliac screw placed on the ilium bone the second method of fixation is we can use bilateral ilio sacral screws so uh, screws passing through the sacrum through the ilium but uh, since we have two fracture lines two longitudinal fracture lines on either side we may need to put a long trans uh, sacral trans iliac screw or two uh, bilateral ilio sacral screws rarely some surgeons have uh, advised this concept of triangular osteosynthesis they, they say that uh, this provides a further three point compression and contact in uh, in a patient with a high transverse sacral fracture so they combine these two treatments they fix the spine using the spinal pelvic fixation along with that they add this iliosacral screws for additional stability
So uh, coming to our patient which I had described earlier, so this is this would be classified as a U-shaped transverse fr fracture of the sacrum, and uh, she was treated by a posterior lumbopelvic fixation since uh, she had a neurological deficit and the fracture is displaced. So the fracture was reduced by indirect reduction maneuver. So we extend the pelvis as well as the hip joint so that it produces a reduction forces through the lateral part of the intact sacrum and uh, uh, pedicle screws at L4 and L5 and uh, iliac screw on either side. So this, this is the immediate post-operative radiograph and this is at the end of 12 months. Uh, you can see that the fracture is uh, fully healed and uh, though she has a kyphosis at the level of the fracture, she didn't have any functional uh, uh, outcomes, uh, poor outcomes because of this uh, kyphosis. And at the end of 12 months, we all, all, always advise a removal of the implant so that uh, her lumbosacral mobility can be retained. So after the 12 months, we remove the screws and then get back uh, to our, uh, spinal back strengthening exercises. So like I told, this is the uh, second option, bilateral percutaneous iliosacral screws can be used. But uh, importantly, this uh, uh, technique can be used only when the fracture is well reduced or only in undisplaced fractures. If the fracture is displaced, then uh, this uh, uh, screw fixation cannot be used. And uh, we can also need to understand that this fixation is not as rigid as a spinal pelvic fixation. So if you have a unstable fracture, grossly unstable fracture where the fracture is going medial to the facet uh, and if there is injury to the transverse process at the level of L5 indicating a disruption of the iliolumbar ligament, then better not to use this technique and go for a standard fixation. Rarely some surgeons have advised direct osteosynthesis of the fracture fragments where we directly expose the fracture fix the fracture fragments by placing uh, pedicle screws as well as uh, thin lateral mass screws and then uh, using a plate or a rod to reduce the fracture completely. But this is a zone with a very uh, a poor blood supply over the skin and subcutaneous region and uh, hence uh, better not to uh, do a direct osteosynthesis and an indirect reduction actually gives uh, equal results to direct fixation of the fracture fragments. Rarely, as I told, uh, uh, transverse sacral fractures can uh, follow an osteoporosis, uh, osteoporotic patient. So uh, sometimes patients are present with a severe low back pain even without a history of trauma. And if you assess carefully, so these patients will have a, a fracture line going through the sacral foramina with mild extension into the uh, iliac, uh, into the sacral ala. And usually the MR is very uh, confirmatory. So you'll see, able to see edema in the middle of the sacral bone. And uh, most of these patients, they have very excruciating pain. So uh, with adequate treatment of osteoporosis and uh, bed rest, most of these factors will heal uh, with good outcomes. But if it is getting displaced or if it is causing severe pain, preventing the patient even from uh, mobilizing to the for personal hygiene, then the other option is we can do a sacroplasty, where similar to a vertebroplasty, we can inject cement into the uh, sacral uh, fracture zone and uh, inject cement on either side. The other option is we can also use a percutaneous uh, use sacral screws that also provides uh, equivalent outcomes. So coming to the conclusion, so uh, we learned that sacral fractures are of two types, the common ones associated with the pelvic injuries or the longitudinal fractures. Whereas the rare type is the transverse sacral fractures, which can be classified into the high transverse and the low transverse. Low transverse are the ones which happen below the sacral leg joint and uh, quite stable injuries which can be treated conservatively. Whereas the high transverse fractures are associated with uh, longitudinal extensions into the uh, sacral zone, so they are potentially unstable and we should treat them as spinal pelvic disruptions. And uh, the main uh, outcome in these patients would depend on the extent of uh, fracture displacement and neurological deficit which happens at the time of the injury. And uh, if at all we are going to uh, treat the patient surgically, the common preferred option is a spinal pelvic fixation with screws in the pedicle screws in the L4 and L5 as well as the ileum bone. And this usually gives very good outcomes for this patient. The other option is we can use the bilateral iliosacral screws. Thank you.